Sir Arthur Conan Doyle claimed he based the character of Sherlock Holmes on a teacher of his, Dr. Joseph Bell, whose real powers of deductive logic awed all who knew him. Yet Dr. Bell, in a letter to Conan Doyle, stated quite bluntly, You are yourself, Sherlock Holmes, and well you know it. Conan Doyle did not dispute this statement, for in fact Sherlock Holmes had the best characteristics of his creator. So did Dr. Watson. Highly educated, honest to the core, and one of the best writers of the Victorian age, the British public and then the world took him to their hearts. It was not long before the doctor-turned-writer found himself a well-established man of letters and friend to such countrymen as Oscar Wilde, Rudyard Kipling, and H.G. Wells. Not bad company to be with. In real life, Conan Doyle solved more than two actual murder mysteries, saving the lives of innocent men by his careful research, gathering of facts, and deductive reasoning. Few men in history can claim such feats. When he died in 1930, a time not so long ago, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had this epitaph engraved on his tombstone. Steel true, blade straight, Arthur Conan Doyle, knight, patriot, physician, and man of letters. Fitting words for such a giant of a man. And now, Basil Rathbun and Nigel Bruce in The Adventure of the Double Zero. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to spend the next half hour listening to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And say, let me tell you something I found out just the other day. Steaks are really back again. Good, thick, juicy porterhouse steaks. Mm, that's for me. A thick, tender steak on the rare side, together with a glass of Petri California Burgundy. You know, Petri Burgundy is a perfect mealtime wine. And with meat or any meat dish, it's the very last word in good eating. Honestly, when you taste the wonderful flavor of that rich red Petri Burgundy, you're tasting one swell example of the art of winemaking. It's full flavored and just about the most delicious wine that ever poured from a bottle. Try it the next time you have steak or chops, or the next time you have hamburger or pot roast. Believe me, Petri Burgundy is the best friend a good meal ever had. And now let's look in on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Evening, Doctor. Just in time to join me in a cup of coffee. Draw up your chair, young fellow, my lad. Thank you. Ah, that's it. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure takes us to the south of France. That's right, Mr. Bartell. The south of France in the year 1900. A beautiful playground bordered by the bluest of blue seas and populated with an extraordinary cross-section of cosmopolitan Europe. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. All of them attracted by that Riviera paradise. All of them drawn by the magical spell of a small white ball spinning round the rim of a roulette wheel. Now, don't tell me that you and the great Sherlock Holmes were there on a gambling spree. We were not, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> At the time my story begins, we just concluded an extremely delicate mission. A mission, I may say, that... Uh, concerns the safety and good name of uh, a very prominent member of the royal family. Say, Doctor, you don't mean... Uh, one story at a time, Mr. Bartell. In any event, my boy, I'm afraid that's a case about which my lips are sealed for all time. But to return to tonight's adventure, one June evening, I persuaded Holmes to accompany me to the gambling casino at Fregius, not far from Cannes, where we were staying wasn't quite as fashionable as a casino at Monte Carlo, but as I intended to do a little modest gambling myself, it seemed an establishment more suited to my means. As we stood there at the green baize covered tables, the chatter of voices and the melodic chanting of the croupiers as they called the results of each spin of the wheel 
formed a background to a quiet conversation that Holmes and I were having. Lost again, Watson. Oh, oh, confounded. That number 10 must come up soon. Oh, why not cut your losses, old fellow, and come for a stroll with me on the water? Well, just a big wake. A couple more bets, Holmes. I, I have a feeling that 10 is bound to come up in a minute. <laughs> Watson, I believe the blood of a gambler courses through your veins. Oh, there's no harm in taking a little flutter once in a while. Why don't you risk a few francs, Holmes? Oh, oh thanks, you, my dear chap. The law of averages convinces me that my money is safer in my pocket. In any case, I'm a little dubious as to the integrity of this particular casino. Huh? What makes you say that? Well, you will observe that this roulette wheel has a double zero. Most continental wheels have only a single one. It would indicate that this house is extremely concerned with its percentage. Mesdames et messieurs, faites-vous deux. Oh, just two more turns of the wheel, Holmes, and I'll take that walk with you. Oh, you misses the gear spieling. Why do you not play from the other side of the table? Why must you always stand next to me? Hello. The trouble up there. I've placed my bet, so, so let's go and see. I ask you, so why do you play here beside me? I'm afraid I don't see any reason why I can't play wherever I swish. You are, you've broken my luck. Ever since you come to the table, I've done nothing but lose. Please, to move away. Well, move away yourself if you don't like my company. Heinrich, why do you not stop now? You've already lost more than we can afford. One more throw in, sir. I can win it all back if only this young man will move away. Why should my husband move? He's had a bad run of luck, too. Rien ne va plus. Ah, oh, you've lost again, Watson. Heinrich, you must stop now. I must stop him, sir, because I've lost everything. I hope you're satisfied, Mr. American. You've broken my luck and ruined me. I hope that you and your turn will be ruined too. Heinrich! Heinrich, wait for me! I never heard such rubbish in my life. Were you listening to him, sir? I heard his last few remarks, Mr. Uh, Gilbert. Roger Gilbert. And this is my wife, Helen. How do you do? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? How do, you do? Didn't you think his remarks were a little out of place, Doctor? Yes, I certainly did, Mrs. Gilbert. I don't see how he can possibly blame your husband for his run of bad luck. I didn't like the look on his face as he left the table, though. Have you any idea who he is? His name is Schneeman. He's staying at the same hotel as we are. I've never spoken to him, but I've heard him being page there. Well, he shouldn't gamble unless he can afford to lose. Well, I'm losing, darling, and I can't afford it. Oh, but I can let you have more money. You know that. Oh, no, Helen, I, I may have married an heiress, but I'm not going to use her fortune to gamble with. Oh. <laughs> I'll lose my own money and then I'll quit. Mesdames et messieurs, fake for Your last bit, Watson? Yes, Holmes. This time I know that number 10 is going to come up. It's got to. <laughs> I've lost again, darn it. Helen, this is my bad night. Well, why don't you stop now, dear? Holmes, I've made 350 francs. On this throw of the wheel, old fellow, but as you've lost some 500 francs doing it, I can't say that your profits stagger me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, <laughs> I can see that you're no gambler. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Gilbert. I wouldn't say that, Holmes. Uh, you may not like roulette. You've taken a good many chances in your life, with long odds against you, too. Well, nevertheless, old chap, in the sense Mrs. Gilbert means it, I'm not a gambler. Oh, that's a good idea. Say, what's the commotion over there? It's that German woman with a crowd forming around him. Yes, yes, the wife of that man that said I ruined him. Attention! Attention! Est-ce qu'il y a un docteur dans la salle? There must be trouble. He's asking for a doctor. A doctor? Come along, then. Will you excuse me, please? Thank you. Excuse me, madame. Mon ami, il y a un docteur. Monsieur! What happened, madam? It is my husband. Is he ill? I just found him lying out in the garden. Please come with me at once, gentlemen. Uh, of course we will, madam. What seems to be the matter with him? Here, doctor. I think he is dead. He's lying by that tree, doctor. Please see if you can help him. Somebody else seems to be on the scene before us. Who are you, sir? I am Monsieur Chevray, director of the casino. Do any of you know this poor man? I am his wife. Is he... is he dead? I... I am afraid so, madame. Let me look at him. I'm a doctor. Was your husband gambling in the casino tonight, madame? Yeah, he was. Poor Heinrich. He lost everything that we have. I'm afraid he's dead, madame. Shot through the heart. Oh, do leap a God. Suicide, Watson? Yeah, looks like it. Mm. Yes. Powder burns on the shirt front, 
Revolver clutched in the right hand, fingers in a natural position. The angle of the wound settles it. Obviously self-inflicted. I missed you as you slipped out of the casino. What's wrong with him? I'm afraid he's dead, Mr. Gilbert. Yes, he committed suicide. I hope, young man, that you are satisfied. All night you brought him bad luck. He asked you to move away from him to change his luck, but no, you could not do it. Oh, Frau Schneemann, I'm terribly sorry, but I really don't see how you can blame me. I do blame you, and I also blame you, Monsieur Chevry. Me? But what have I done, madame? Why do you let a man lose all his money at your tables? Is life so cheap to you, and money so important that you cannot close the tables to someone before he's ruined? Madame, I am all sympathy for you in your tragic loss. But the casino cannot be held responsible. If your husband could not afford to gamble, then he should not come here. How are we to know the financial limitations of, uh, of our customers? You said that your husband lost everything you had tonight, madame. Yeah, everything. Then how do you account for this sheaf of banknotes in his breast pocket? Good Lord, must be several thousand francs, sir. Then he wasn't ruined. And his suicide, therefore, cannot be blamed on his losses at my casino, madame. How do you count for this money, Frau Schneemann? Well, I do not understand. Heinrich kept nothing from me. I know that he had not so much money on him when he started tonight. Uh, well, why do you all look at me like that? Is it that you think? You think... Quick, why think she's fainted? I've got her. We must, must get her to her room. You can take her to my suite in the casino. No, let's take her to the hotel. My wife will look after her. Poor woman, she's had a dreadful shock. She can probably do with another woman's company. That's very considerate of you, Mr. Gilbert. Where are you staying? At the Hotel Creon. It's quite near here. I'll get a cabin while I'm doing that, Watson. See if you can revive her, will you? Then can't. we'll take her to the Hotel Creon. It's very kind of you, Mrs. Gilbert, to let us bring the poor lady into your suite. Well, it's the least I can do, in spite of what she said about Roger bringing her husband bad luck. Oh, I'm sure she'll need your help when she wakes up, Helen. Yes, I think you'll find that she'll sleep for some hours. I gave her a strong sedative. Well, we were just about to have a drink, gentlemen. Do you care to join us? Oh, thank you, sir. Well, that'd be very nice, Mr. Gilbert. Roger was just telling me that quite a large sum of money was found on Herr Shaman's body, Mr. Holmes. Uh, yes, Mrs. Gilbert. Several thousand francs. It's very puzzling, Holmes. Why should a man commit suicide with so much money on him? I think the answer is obvious. He didn't. What on earth do you mean? Well, the money was placed there after he had shot himself. The banknotes were in his breast pocket, if you remember. Hardly the usual place to carry money. Though it is the easiest pocket for someone to insert it without disturbing the body. But why on earth should someone place money on him after his suicide? Prevent the casino from getting a bad name. I've heard of it being done on several similar occasions. Gives the impression that the unfortunate victim had other motives than gambling losses to account for his suicide. Great Scott, you mean that one of the casino employees found the body lying there and slipped the money in his breast pocket before we arrived on the scene? As you know, my dear Watson, I'm not a gambling man, but I'll lay you a hundred to one. That is what happened. Well, that's a new one. Well, here are your drinks, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Say, Helen, Mr. Holmes has given me a brainwave. Another one? What is it this time, Roger? Now, I've been losing very heavily tonight. Roger, I've told you. If you need money, I'll be only... But I don't. I've got a scheme for making some. Oh. I'm going to gamble again tonight after dinner. If I lose, here's what I'll do. I'll stain my shirt front with red ink, walk out in the grounds, fire a shot, and lie down as though I'm dead. I'll wait for someone to come along and stuff my pockets full of banknotes. <laughs> Not a bad idea, Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> I think it's a darn good one. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Well, it's a whimsical one at any rate. Who knows? You might even be successful. Roger, you're not really going to do it, are you? Sure. Perhaps I'll get some of my losses back that way. <laughs> well, let's drink to it, gentlemen. At least I may have hit upon an idea of making money. <laughs> Dear Watson, you'll have to work hard at your practice when you get back to England. Your infallible system appears to be extremely fallible. And yet the fellow who told me about it said it couldn't miss. It's just a matter of doubling the stakes each time you lose oh, and then... Oh, my dear fellow, I've been studying your system. But I can tell you a really infallible way of making money at roulette. You can? What is it? Well, 
Own the gambling house and operate the tables yourself. The odds would be all in your favor. Oh, what a brilliant suggestion. Own the gambling house and operate the tables. Enough gambling for tonight, Watson? Nearly 11 o'clock. No, I think so. Let's take a stroll around the other table, shall we? By the way, old fellow, the young American, Mr. Gilbert, was losing heavily again tonight. He was? I wonder if he'll try that trick that he threatened, the one with the red ink and the shot in the night. I shouldn't be at all surprised. As a matter of uh, interest, I saw him leave the tables about half an hour ago. <laughs> Here comes his wife on the arm of Monsieur Chevrolet, the director of the casino. Good evening, Mrs. Gilbert. Monsieur? Bonsoir, monsieur. Hello, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Monsieur Chevrolet is giving me a personally conducted tour of the casino. It's quite fascinating. And uh, it is quite fascinating for me to have so beautiful a woman on my arm, <laughs> mademoiselle. <laughs> I know that I am the envy of all the men in the room. Oh, stop <laughs> flattering me so much. I'm not used to it. Mrs. Gilbert, how is um, Frau Schneemann? She seems much better. She wakened an hour ago and insisted on going back to her own room. I wanted her to spend the night with us in our suite, but she wouldn't hear no, of I it. I think I should drop in and see her before I go to bed. Oh. You have finished the gambling for tonight, perhaps, Doctor? Uh, no, perhaps about it, Monsieur Chevry. I've had a bad run at the tables. Oh, I am so sorry. Has anyone seen Roger? He left the tables about half an hour ago, Mrs. Gilbert. After doing as I did and losing quite heavily. So he lost again, did he? I wonder if he'll try that uh, new system he was talking about. <laughs> we were just discussing that possibility ourselves, Mrs. Gilbert. Mrs. Gilbert! Mrs. Gilbert! Frau Schneemann, you shouldn't have left your hotel, you know. It is too late to worry for me, Herr Doctor. It is for Mrs. Gilbert now that you should worry. What do you mean, madame? Well, I went back just now to where poor Heinrich died. And there, lying in the grass, I saw another body. I was too shocked to go too close. But I am quite sure that I recognize your husband, Mrs. Gilbert. Oh, Dr. Watson, she's ruined Roger's trick. And he'll have taken fright and bolted by the time we get there. Watson, maybe let's go at once and find out, shall we? He, he hasn't gone. He's, he's still lying there. It's a most convincing spectacle. That red ink really does look like blood. Yes. And blood sometimes looks like red ink. Mr. Gilbert. Roger, get up. The joke's spoiled. Roger, get up. I'm afraid that's impossible, Mrs. Gilbert. He's dead. Dr. Watson's story will be continued in just a second, which is all the time I need to tell you that the easiest way I know to transform a simple meal into a feast is to serve that meal together with Petri California Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a delicate white wine that's the perfect companion for chicken or turkey. Turkey, ah yes, turkey and Petri Sauterne. That's the heart of any Thanksgiving dinner. Look, why not make this Thanksgiving dinner the best one you ever had? Give it the air of a banquet. Serve it with Petri Sauterne. And when you buy that Sauterne or any wine for your Thanksgiving dinner, Whatever you do, look for the letters P-E-T-R-I, because a Petri wine is always a good wine. Well, Doctor, so the young American's joke turned out to be another tragedy. Yes, Mr. Bartell, the poor fellow was lying there dead with a bullet wound in the heart and a great splash of blood staining the whiteness of his shirt front. What happened next? Monsieur Chevry, director of the casino, took the distraught widow away from the scene while Holmes and I examined the body closely. Within a few minutes, we were joined by Inspector uh, Ganivet of the French police. As we stood there in the moonlight, the sounds of music could be heard from the casino. It was hard to believe that two men had died in that lovely garden since the moon had risen. Monsieur Holmes, you and Dr. Watson have concluded your examination. Yes, Inspector Ganivet. Will you favor me with your observations? You say that you are certain that this is not another suicide? I'm sure of it, Inspector. Look at the wound. The bullet entered the body at a direct right angle, whereas a self-inflicted shot is always fired obliquely. Yes, that is so. Then uh, you suggest that this man was shot from above as he lay on the ground pretending to be dead. I'm convinced of it. Why, Monsieur? Holmes? Well, for two reasons. Though it's impossible to be sure without a laboratory test, I'm certain that beneath those blood stains are stains of red ink. 
Look for yourself, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed it does look like it. What is your other reason for being certain that this man was shot as he lay here pretending death? I show him the banknotes, Watson. Uh, here you are, Inspector. We found them stuffed in his breast pocket. So, banknotes with a bullet hole through the middle of them. Very illuminating. Uh, tell me, gentlemen, how many people knew of this... Uh, this little plot you have told me about, this plan of the dead man's to pretend to be shot. Just three people, Inspector, Dr. Watson, myself, and Mrs. Gilbert. Hello, then the answer is obvious. You and your friend are innocent. It must be the wife who killed him. No one else knew of the plot. No, I'm not so sure of that. Frau Schneemann, the dead German's widow, was in the next room when Gilbert told us about his plan. She might have heard, though I could swear that she was asleep. I gave her a very strong sleeping draught. From what you have told me of her husband's suicide, she might easily have had a motive for murdering this oh, man. Oh, come, 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 gentlemen. Surely it's obvious who murdered Mr. Gilbert? Who, Monsieur Holmes? Well, it's certainly one of the two widows. Since there seems to be some doubt in your minds, I suggest we return to the casino. I can promise you the answer to your question within a very few minutes. <laughs> Well, Monsieur Chevrolet, now that we're all assembled in your office, I shall sit down quietly and let Inspector Ganivet conduct his examination. No, 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 Monsieur Holmes. No, you have handled the case so far. Please to cons continue it to the end. Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I should appreciate it. We <laughs> have it, the casino. Very well, gentlemen. It won't take me long. Frau Schneemann. Yeah, Herr Holmes. At uh, what time did you leave your hotel tonight? Well, I do not know what time it was. Well, what made you leave it? Well, I could not sleep. I knew that they had taken poor Heinrich's body away, but I felt that I must walk back there. It was the last place I saw him alive. How close did you come to Mr. Gilbert's body when you saw it lying there? Oh, close enough to see who it was. Then I ran into the casino to tell his wife I knew what had happened. How did you know? You say you uh, didn't come close to the body. I could tell by every line of the body as it lay there. I could tell because I knew that poor Heinrich's death would not be avenged. Thank you, Frau Schneemann. That will be all. You may go. But Monsieur Holmes, she has no alibi. Surely you Inspector should Inspector Ganivet, if I'm to conduct this investigation, I must do it my own way. Pardon, Monsieur Holmes. Please continue. Uh, you may go, Frau Schneemann. Mrs. Gilbert? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Where were you prior to our meeting in the casino tonight, just before we discovered your husband's body? After I left the hotel, I walked over here along the seafront. Can anyone verify that statement? I suppose not. I didn't meet anyone that I knew. And what did you do when you arrived at the casino? I played a little chemin de fer. A few moments later, Monsieur Chevrolet came over to the table and asked if he might escort me over the club. Ten minutes after that, we walked into you and Dr. Watson. That is quite true, Monsieur Holmes. I can swear to it. Thank you, Mrs. Gilbert. I'm sorry to distress you with these questions. You may go. I'll wait outside, Mr. Holmes. I must know what happened. Wait for me there, madame. I shall join you in a few minutes and escort you home. Ah, oh, well, another suspect with a poor alibi, alibi eh, hey, Gunnivet? I must say, Monsieur Holmes, your methods puzzle me. It seems to me that both those women should be watched. Yes, I agree with the inspector, Holmes. Please don't worry, inspector. I've asked two of your plain clothes men to keep an eye on the ladies. And now, Monsieur Chevray, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Ask me any questions you wish, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. You will agree that it is the custom of the casino to put money on the bodies of suicides after their death. To give the impression that gambling uh, gambling losses were not responsible for the tragedy. Well, I, I, I do not think... Oh, come now, Chevre. I know that is a fact as well as you do. Exactly. Now, on those rather gruesome occasions, whose responsibility is it to secrete the money? Yours? Or do you entrust the matter to an underling? I do it myself. I see. Did you place the money on Herr Schneemann tonight? Yes, monsieur, I did. And did you also perform the same service on the body of Mr. Gilbert? No. I knew nothing of that death until a German lady, Frau Schneemann, came running into the casino. Excuse me, interrupting, Monsieur. Uh, of course, Inspector. What is it? I think that you are wasting time. It is obvious that Madame Gilbert committed the crime. She knew of her husband's plot, she had no alibi, and she had the motive. For is not uh, <laughs> marriage itself the greatest of all motives for murder? Oh, my dear Inspector. How very cynical. Madame Dupert did not kill her husband. I know it. And what is your opinion, Watson? Well, that German woman, she had no alibi either. And remember, she was half mad with, with grief. Monsieur Chevrolet, you say that you know Mrs. Gilbert is not guilty. How do you know? I was with her myself at the time the murder was committed. Oh, indeed. How very interesting. 
And what time was the murder committed? Well, it, it was... It, it was... Our investigations have never established what time the murder was committed, Monsieur Chevrolet. I'm afraid you've walked into my trap. You've given yourself away. Great right, Scott Chevrolet, it, it was you. Chevrolet, I've known you a good many years, and this is going to be a hard thing to do. I am going to arrest you. Oh, no, you are not, Delivery. Put down that revolver, sir. Do not be frightened, Doctor. I am not going to shoot you. Chevrolet, why did you murder Roger Gilbert tonight? Surely you know that too, Monsieur Holmes. Because I am in love with his wife. She's young, beautiful, and rich. It did not occur to me until I saw the young fool lying there tonight pretending to be dead. In my profession, it is natural that I should carry a revolver. What was simpler? Mr. Gilbert gave me the perfect opportunity. I, I could not resist it. Put down that revolver, Chevrolet. Why are you all so frightened? Surely you know how I am going to use it this time. I think so, monsieur. But it's a coward's way out. What an unperceptive remark for such a perceptive man. No. No, all my life I have been a gambler. I gambled tonight for the highest stakes of all, and, and I lost. No. No, I am not afraid to pay for my losses. Au revoir, monsieur. <laughs> case, Holmes. Uh, I never suspected Chevrolet. And I, old chap, suspected him from the beginning. Well, I wasn't the only one who was stupid anyway. Inspector Ganivet thought it was the wife. True. Very puzzling conclusion for a detective inspector to arrive at. Oh, it seemed logical enough to me at the no, time. No, 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 my dear Watson. Cold logic should have told you otherwise. Roger Gilbert had been losing heavily and had planned this hoax. He obviously had no money on him. Therefore, the money was planted in his pocket by Chevrolet. After he shot him? No, my dear fellow. Before. Before? The bullet hole through the banknotes provided that. Now, uh, had the money been put there innocently, Gilbert would have, um, well, you know, come back to life as soon as the person placing it there had left. He would not have remained lying on the ground for a murderer to find him. And Chevrolet must have bent over him as he lay there, placed the money in his breast pocket, and then fired. Precisely, Watson. Well, Holmes, I must say you solved it very neatly. You've told Inspector... Ganivet, that you wanted no credit in the case. Naturally, uh, publicity would be unfavorable. If you remember, no one is supposed to know that we're in the south of France. <laughs> I'm certain that the inspector learned a few tips about detection tonight. Possibly, old <laughs> fellow. And I <laughs> hope that uh, you have learned a few things about gambling. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, you're backing the wrong color. Hmm? A gambler is usually superstitious, and superstition... Well, I should have told you what color to follow tonight. I still don't understand you, Holmes. I was playing number ten. Exactly. Number ten is black. You should have followed a red color tonight, old fellow. The color of red ink. Red ink. And blood. Say, Doctor, that was a swell story. I didn't know you liked to play roulette. Well, you know, I, I figured out a system for roulette. It's like yours. Uh, every time you lose, you double your money and keep doubling until you win. Oh, it's a great system, Mr. Bartell. There's only one thing wrong with it. What's that? If you lose, you go broke before you win. <laughs> look, 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 take, take my advice. Don't gamble. You can't beat the laws of chance. Uh, but suppose I bet on a sure thing. Like what, for instance? Oh, like the fact that Petri wine is always good wine. It is, you know. Because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. They've been handing down from father to son, from father to son, the art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. Ever since the Petri family started their business way back in the 1800s, they've been perfecting the art of winemaking. That's why Petri wine is always good wine. The Petri family took time to bring you good wine. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, why not take a few seconds of your time to look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. They spell delicious wine, Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had when we were in Stratford-on-Avon many years ago. It concerns an actor, a mysterious boating accident, 
and several dead butterflies. Sounds good, Doctor. I'll see you then. Oh, fine, but now, now, don't forget next week we're going to broadcast our program from the Paramount Theatre in Hollywood for the Victory Loan Drive. So if any of our friends are going to be in Hollywood, we'd love to see them there. Just buy a Victory Bond at any store or bank on Hollywood Boulevard, and in return, you will be given your ticket of admission. Better hurry up, though, before all the seats are gone. Let's really buy lots of those Victory Bonds. Let's finish the job. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. episodes you've just heard, the original The Adventure of Thor Bridge and The Double Zero, are part of the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes starring Basil Rathbun and Nigel Bruce, and are a 1989 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. This is Harry Bartell. Won't you join me again on another cassette when I present Murder in Wax and The Man with the Twisted Lip? Thank you for listening. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio.